Hey, welcome everybody to so, uh, uh, and I also the first uh, uh, physics supply uh, physics uh, uh, colloquium of the small people here. Second, uh, no, this is the second one. Second one. Right, sorry. Uh, so, uh, uh, I'm standing in for Roger Blanford who couldn't be here today. He's the host, but I'm the host in absentia. Uh, and uh, it's my pleasure to uh, to introduce to you Julie McHenry from NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. And Julie is uh, one of the key people associated with what she's going to talk about today, uh, which is uh, new insights into the high energy universe. Julie uh, joined Goddard Space Flight Center, uh, let's see, about 10 years ago? 2002, 15 years ago. 2002. Oh, time flies. Okay. Uh, so, but before that, Julie was, uh, uh, she received her uh, bachelor's degree from the University of Manchester and did a PhD uh, at the University College in Dublin and, uh, and mentioned made her way to, uh, to Maryland and where she is a, uh, the project scientist for the Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope and also she's just recently became the deputy project scientist for the wide field infrared space telescope mission, which is the next big NASA observatory uh, that will uh, be launched. Uh, you'll tell us, right? Uh, I'm talking about it, gamma rays here. After, uh, the Webb Space Telescope, <laughs> probably. Uh, but anyway, so Julie is uh, involved in that mission. And so an important leadership role at, uh, at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. She's also an adjunct professor of physics at the University of Maryland and also at George Washington University uh, in Washington, D.C. So uh, her, uh, she's also worked as a PhD student, worked on the Whipple Observatory, which was one of the, I think, the first successful Air Cherenkov telescope uh, that detected very high energy gamma rays from cosmological sources that uh, where very high energy gamma ray converts creates an air shower in the Earth's atmosphere. And uh, she worked on that and also is involved with the Milagro experiment, which is uh, uh, as a postdoc at the University of Utah and at the University of Wisconsin. So anyway, without further do I turn this over to Julie? Thanks. Great. Thank you. Um, it's. Uh, am I too loud? Um, no. Okay. Um, so it's a great pleasure to um, to be here. Um, I was going to talk about um, gamma ray astrophysics generally um, because in the last 15 years uh, we've had a spectacular leap forward in our knowledge of the extreme universe through observations with gamma rays. Um, but this is the 10 year anniversary of Fermi's launch um, and I'm the Fermi project scientist so you'll find uh, that this is not in fact a general talk about um, gamma ray astrophysics over the past uh, 10 to 15 years and instead I want to take you through um, a journey on some of the highlights of what we've learned from Fermi and with friends of Fermi um, uh, over, the past, uh, over the past 10 years. Um, I'm going to speak fairly, I wanted to cover there's lots of very exciting things that have come from Fermi. Uh, because I want to cover many of them, um, I'm not going to go into any particular level uh, of depth. What I'm hoping that you take away from this presentation is that what we've done over the last 10 years with Fermi has been transformational, that it's been very broad, that we've done some things we expected to do, that we've done some things we didn't expect to do, um, and that there is a common theme in understanding where the most energetic things are, how acceleration happens in a variety of different places in the universe. Okay, so I'll start with um, a sort of standard slide on, on gamma ray astrophysics. Um, this is an electromagnetic spectrum. Um, you probably all know that. Um, I made this uh, particular toy spectrum in, um, in PowerPoint because the standard uh, picture of a spectrum that you get in most textbooks um, has gamma rays pretty much starting and ending at one MeV. But everything 
above a few hundred keV is called a gamma ray. The gamma ray band is extraordinarily broad. The Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope all by itself covers a huge swath of the gamma ray band. If you were to take the top energy of Fermi to the bottom energy of Fermi, it would be the equivalent of having a single instrument that could cover from microwave all the way through to, uh, to x-rays. And the gamma rays are unique. We don't see gamma rays coming from thermal processes. When we see high energy gamma rays, what we're really seeing is evidence of ch uh, charged particles that are being accelerated up to even higher energies. So our picture of the high energy gamma ray sky is really a picture of where the high energy acceleration, accelerating processes are happening. So in a sense, it's zooming in on some of the most extreme places in the universe, places where we have very high magnetic fields, very high uh, gravitational um, potentials. Because we're looking at places where we're seeing um, particles, charged particles accelerated to very high energies, our connection to cosmic rays and to neutrino astrophysics is very natural. A place that can produce high energy gamma rays can also produce cosmic rays and neutrinos. So I'm going to be largely talking about Fermi. This is a picture of the Fermi Observatory and the fairing um, shortly before launch. Um, the dull grey box on the top is the main instrument. It's the Large Area Telescope. It sees um, about a fifth of the sky at any instance. It operates from 20 uh, MeV to 300 GeV. Um, and we operate in a mode where we sweep out the entire sky every three hours. We have a second instrument, the Gamma Ray Burst Monitor, which operates from 8 keV to uh, 40 MeV. And the, the GBM is designed to detect brief flashes of gamma rays, to study the transient uh, gamma ray sky at lower energies than LAT, to connect the groundbreaking high energy observations with LAT to the better understood uh, lower energy regime. So just, just taking a few minutes to describe how the LAT works. Um, we're de we detect gamma rays via the way that they interact. In the lat energy range, the interaction is pair conversion. So a, a gamma ray comes in, it converts um, in one of our tracker towers. Uh, we have layers of tungsten um, in, in which the conversions happen. Uh, we track the um, positions of the resulting electrons and positrons and reconstruct those tracks to determine where the gamma ray came from. Uh, the energy is measured in a calorimeter at the bottom. The calorimeter is, um, uh, is, uh, is made of um, uh, in an organic uh, scintillator. And the entire instrument is surrounded by uh, a plastic scintillator anti-coincidence detector. And the anti-coincidence detector is necessary because for every gamma ray we detect, um, 10,000 charged particles um, hit the instrument. And since what we're fundamentally measuring in the instrument is, char is the charged particles that are produced in the pair conversion uh, interaction, um, we need to have uh, a veto. So just some quick numbers. Um, our tracker is um, 18 layers of uh, silicon strip detector. Uh, we have about 800 and 80,000 uh, channels. Our anti-coincidence detector is segmented so that we don't generate false vetoes from high energy deposits uh, in the uh, instrument. And the calorimeter has uh, logs of cesium iodide bars uh, arranged hotoscopically so that we can reconstruct the shape of the shower in the, um, uh, in the calorimeter to help with um, uh, energy loss out of the bottom of the shower and with, uh, with background rejection. Um, the instrument uses uh, remarkably little power for having almost uh, a million channels of, uh, of electronics. So what do we see? Um, this is our, um, our sky above, above 1 MeV. Um, you might see this uh, all over the place. I don't really get tired of looking at it because this is, you know, really represents one of our, our prime outputs. What you're seeing here um, is the gamma ray sky in galactic coordinates. So that, if bright swath across the center is our Milky Way galaxy. So the thing that looks very faint and dim if you were looking at the sky with your eyes in the gamma ray band is blazingly bright. Uh, the vast majority of the photons that we detect are coming from uh, a diffuse glow in our galaxy when um, cosmic rays are interacting with uh, gas and radiation fields in our galaxy to produce this uh, glow. 
superimposed on that are a very large number of sources of gamma rays. Uh, one of the achievements of Fermi is that we've um, increased the number of known gamma ray sources by more than an order of magnitude. Now, simply detecting more gamma ray sources is not interesting by itself. What I will tell you later in this talk is how we've used the very broad energy range, our ability to monitor those sources as a function of time to really understand um, what's going on in these, uh, in these objects. The broad energy range of Fermi Lat combined with um, several years of observation time allows us to make maps not just above 1 GeV where the uh, peak sensitivity of the, of the instrument but also to extend to uh, higher energies. And if we go from 1 GeV to 10 GeV you can see some of the sources in the sky will disappear and some will appear. And if you look closely uh, here you can see um, now the emergence of two large lobes of emission uh, above and below um, the galactic center. I'll talk a little bit more about those later in this, um, in this presentation. And then if we go to even higher energies and make a map of the sky above 50 GeV, this map is particularly relevant because this is the one that can be used as a finding chart for the narrow field uh, ground-based instruments to identify likely and interesting places to look on the, on the sky. Um, and the, again, we see objects above 50 GeV that we do not see at 1 GeV and vice versa. We don't just see the sky in a static way. If I take our field of view and show you how it sweeps across the sky every two orbits, so what you're seeing here is, um, is the field of view of the large area telescope as it moves across the sky every two orbits. So we get to see the sky not just over a very, very broad um, energy range to much greater sensitivity, to a much better angular resolution than before. We also get to see how the gamma ray sky evolves as a function of time, which means that we can make a movie. So what I'm showing here is uh, a movie of the, an animation of the gamma ray sky for our first year of observations. Um, the projection is the north galactic hemisphere on the left hand side and the right galactic hemi uh, the south galactic hemisphere on the right hand side. Um, this means that the very bright Milky Way is, uh, is around the edge and now you can see individual objects that are getting brighter and dimmer by uh, very large factors on short timescales. These objects are active galaxies, uh, galaxies that contain a supermassive black hole and for most of these in the case of Fermi what we're seeing is that subset of uh, active galaxies that have a relativistic jet and the jet is pointing directly at us. There's also a source running around in there and that's the sun, which you all knew because this is a whole year of observations and it completes one cycle in a year. Uh, the second instrument is the gamma ray burst monitor. Um, this consists of 14 disks of scintillator, seven on one side of the, of the observatory and seven on the uh, other. The, relative in the disks are at different orientations and the relative intensity of a gamma ray flux between the different scintillators allows us to reconstruct uh, where the, uh, these uh, gamma ray outbursts are going. Um, so what we see here is um, it's designed to detect and classify and characterize gamma ray transients on board very quickly, transmit the location and nature of those transients uh, to a ground-based uh, community of observers. What you're seeing here is triggers as a function of time. So we're starting uh, at launch on the... Um, uh, on the left-hand side. Um, green are gamma ray bursts flashes of gamma rays coming from objects at cosmological distances. We also see flashes of gamma rays coming from soft gamma repeaters. These are highly magnetized uh, neutron stars in our galaxy that every periodically go into large uh, outburst uh, mode and give us a very large number of triggers. In fact, if you look at the um, large group of yellow um, in, uh, in 2009, um, that represents the time that our flight operations team concluded that they no longer needed to get uh, a page every time the GBM triggered, um, because all of those came in the same weekend. Um, moving even closer, uh, we see solar flares. The uh, orange 
are the solar flares. So what you can see um, clearly is the increase in solar activity as we, as we continued through the 10 year um, uh, journey of the mission. And then finally, very, very close to home in black, are terrestrial gamma ray flashes. Flashes of gamma rays produced uh, from thunderstorms on Earth. Now the thunderstorms didn't just start in quarter four of 2009. We've had thunderstorms on Earth the whole time. Um, what changed was the trigger criterion on uh, GBM. We realized that the GBM was not just the most prolific detector of gamma ray bursts in orbit. It is also the most prolific detector of terrestrial gamma ray flashes. So we're studying extremes on Earth and uh, in space. So now I'm going to take a little wander through some of my uh, favorite results from the last, uh, from the last uh, 10 years. So um, starting in 2008, the, one of the first things that we did when what we were planning to do um, after launch was uh, we wanted to test that we could point to the observatory rather than just be in a like, scanning mode. But you want to pick something to look at. We chose to spend two weeks pointing at a bright gamma ray source that was known as a gamma ray source, but we did not know uh, what was producing the gamma rays. And the reason that we didn't know the origin of the gamma rays is that if you look at the, um, at the plot on the, uh, the left-hand side, uh, what you're seeing is a radio map of uh, the supernova um, uh, in uh, CTA. There's a small black cross that represents the location of a uh, X-ray point source, and we could not tell from the uh, previous gamma ray observations with Egret whether the gamma rays were coming from that point source or from the supernova remnant. With the Fermi Lab observations, we reduced the size of the localization from the blue circle to the red circle, so it's clearly now landing right on top of the X-ray source. But even more than that, when we looked at the uh, time of arrival of the gamma ray photons, we realized that the photons were arriving um, uh, periodically. Um, that if we folded the gamma ray light curve on timescales of 316 milliseconds, you get a very well-defined pattern. And that what we were actually seeing is a pulsar that was shining in gamma rays. And this was the beginning of really an extraordinary adventure with uh, Fermi, because this represented the first of, um, sorry, the, my next slide isn't the one I expected it to be. This represents um, the first of uh, a very large number of pulsar detections. Um, we've realized now that the um, number of young pulsars that are bright in radio and gamma ray is equal, or roughly equal, to the number of pulsars, young pulsars that are bright in gamma ray only. And that we were missing a large fraction of the end stage of stellar evolution before the launch of Fermi. Another surprise is that we saw a very, very large number of millisecond pulsars. Millisecond pulsars are pulsars that have reached um, uh, the end of their life and then get spun up by accretion from a companion. So they have a lower magnetic field but a very, very rapid, um, uh, rapid uh, spin rate. And besides simply detecting these with Fermi, these millisecond pulsars are interesting all by themselves. So Fermi has turned out to be uh, transformational in finding millisecond pulsars. But the millisecond pulsars that Fermi finds are the ones that are very close to transition. So in several cases, we've seen an object transition from being a millisecond pulsar where um, it's being powered by a rotational um, uh, uh, energy to being an accreting pulsar where it's being powered by accretion from its neighboring object. So I show one example of that here. Um, what you're seeing is uh, time along the x-axis and the gamma ray flux on the y-axis. And the gamma ray flux was low um, until 2013. And at that point, the radio pulsation suddenly stopped and the gamma ray uh, flux was steady, but rocketed up. And what we think we're seeing is a transition um, to a state where accretion from the companion object is driving jets that are producing that gamma ray flux. And this is not something that we expected. The pulsars themselves um, have a wind that power a shock in the region around the pulsar. 
This provides a very large amount of energy to accelerate particles to extremely high energies. These systems, known as pulsar wind nebulae, represent um, the largest class of galactic TEV gamma ray emitters. These are the galactic sources that are seen by ground-based gamma ray observatories. Uh, one of the most famous examples of a pulsar wind nebula is, uh, is the crab. And the crab has been used for a long time as a reference source in gamma ray astrophysics. So in my thesis, when we weren't sure how to calibrate the instrument, we just took the flux of the crab that we saw on one night from the flux of the object that I was tracking as a function of time, divided one by the other and said, this is the flux of my source in units of the crab. That only works if your object is constant. And one of the most spectacular results from uh, Fermi Lash was discovering that not only is the crab not constant, it's dramatically variable at times. In September 2011, we saw uh, an extremely large flare. And this was the second flare that we'd seen. So when we saw the first one in April, we knew that the crab could be variable. And when the second amount of variability happened, we reacted quickly to change the mode of the observatory to point directly at the crab to get the most sensitive observations that we could. And in this, we saw that the crab is varying on timescales of hours. Very, very rapid, which implies a very small uh, emission region in the object. We could also see from the spectra that the variability was happening at the, at the um, peak of uh, the synchrotron component, which allowed us to infer that it was the highest energy um, particles that were showing this variability. And this has transformed our understanding of how these particles are accelerated in, uh, in these uh, systems, because the standard expectation of shock acceleration cannot um, produce such high energies with such rapid variability. Another big surprise has been the discovery that stellar novae are bright in gamma rays. The first time we saw this was in um, March 2009 at a collaboration meeting where we found a new transient object along the galactic plane. And when we went to propose for X-ray observations to follow up on this new source that we'd found, we realized that Swift was already looking at that place on the sky. And we hadn't yet told anybody we'd found a new transient. But what had actually happened is two um, amateur astronomers in Japan had found an optical nova, and Swift was making observations of the optical nova. And this was, for us, the realization that we were seeing high energy gamma rays from these systems. And this was a surprise, that if we had had an instrument where you had to make choices of where to look, it would have been a long time before it would occur to us to look for gamma rays from stellar novae. And we first thought, okay, well, there's something special about this system, and we convinced ourselves that this was a very unusual nova, and that was why we were seeing that we, that we had the conditions that allowed the, the particles to be accelerated to sufficiently high energies to produce what we see. Uh, but we now know that, gam that stellar novae routinely produce uh, gamma rays. And I mentioned before that gamma rays uh, can only be produced in non-thermal processes. So in one of our most interesting um, novae, this Assassin uh, 16MA, we have very, very nice uh, gamma ray observations that show a rapid increase in the, um, in the gamma rays. And then as you're tracking the gamma rays as a function of time, we see the gamma ray flux drop and rise again. Optical observations at the same time show the same drop and rise. And since the gamma rays can only be produced um, by the non-thermal particles, in particles that we're assuming are accelerated in shocks in the system, seeing the same behavior in the optical is telling us that in these systems, um, most of the emission is from shocks. And this is a, was a surprise. While all of these results were coming through, we weren't sitting on our hands. Um, we're constantly striving to try and make um, the instrument better. For every event that we detect in the lab, we collect a huge amount of information. We have a large number of channels uh, in the tracker, calorimeter, and anti-coincidence detector. And starting shortly after launch, we worked on a major revamp of the ground-based um, uh, processing. This increased um, our effective area, which tells us how many events, we gamma rays we detect in the, uh, in the instrument as a function of how many are hitting, uh, hitting the instrument. We increase the field of view. We increase the energy range. 
and we increased and improved the angular resolution. When we provided this reprocessed data, it was the equivalent of overnight giving the community a couple of years of extra data. And I've got some examples on this, uh, on this chart that show, uh, that show um, how big those improvements were. Um, on the bottom right is the light curve um, from, um, from the crab. The yellow represents the old processing and the blue represents the new. And you can see that the peaks that, that are from when the crab is pulsing are much, much uh, sharper with pass out. And similarly, you can see in a um, map of the Cygnus region in the top right um, how much better pass out is. So one of the results that we got with that was to take, um, was to look at a supernova remnant, um, <clears throat> IC443. So I've mentioned pulsars, and I mentioned uh, pulsar wind nebulae. The supernova remnant is the, uh, at the end of a star's life, when it explodes, it sends um, uh, uh, emission out into the interstellar medium. The shock at that outer boundary is the um, supernova remnant. What you see from gamma rays can depend on where that shock is, uh, is um, accelerating into. If you have a region where you have a um, molecular cloud, the protons accelerated at the shock can interact with uh, the target in the, in the molecular cloud to produce a higher flux of gamma rays. What we were able to do with the improved data from PASS-8 is to look at this object as a, in a spatially resolved way and combine this data with uh, Veritas, a ground-based gamma ray observatory. So what you see on the bottom right is uh, four segments of um, IC443. Different regions have very, very different brightnesses because they have very different um, uh, sort of target material for the charged particles to um, interact. But something that's incredibly remarkable is despite the fact that these different quadrants have different, um, very different uh, environments, the spectral shape is the same. They all have a break at the same point. And what we learn from this is that um, in this particular uh, supernova remnant, uh, we really are seeing um, acceleration of cosmic rays from rest and not re-acceleration of, uh, of ambient cosmic rays. Moving on to a slightly larger scale, um, I mentioned these large lobes of emission above and below the galactic center. Uh, in 2010, um, uh, a group of authors produced uh, a paper on the Fermi bubbles. Here what we're seeing are uh, lobes of emission extending 50 degrees above and 50 degrees below the galactic plane. The spectrum of this emission is much harder than in the, the diffuse emission in the rest of the, of the galaxy, telling us that these lobes are containing a population of high energy particles. We can't yet tell whether those are predominant or the gamma rays are produced from electrons or protons, but we can tell that there are energetic particles there. They have a sharp edge, which implies that they were produced in some um, impulsive uh, event um, several million years ago. And HST observations um, looking at um, uh, Doppler shifts in these lines can tell us the expansion velocity of the bubbles, which allows us to determine when these outbursts occur at the galactic center. So we have a fairly clear picture that this is the imprint of uh, activity at our galactic center a couple of million years ago. I'll move on. But we have a second puzzle um, at the galactic center. If we go even closer in, if we look um, at the inner 10 degrees around the galactic center, here we've got another excess. If we model the diffuse galactic emission as well as we can and look at what remains, we get left with a spatially extended uh, excess that has a, a peak at a, a few GeV. The spatial distribution of this excess and the spectral shape of this excess is consistent with what we would expect from a signature of uh, dark matter produced by WIMP annihilation at the galactic center. The intensity of this emission is consistent with a WIMP annihilation occurring at the thermal cross section. So this is in principle terribly exciting, but it's not the only way that we could produce this kind of excess. 
one of the other things that we've learned from Fermi is that we're very, very good at finding pulsars. And this emission is also consistent with a population of uh, dim gamma ray emitting pulsars that combined appear as a diffuse flux. Uh, we wanted to study this more, so in 2013 we changed the observing pattern of the observatory to bias our observations towards the galactic center. Uh, this gave us um, an increase in, um, uh, in exposure, and the studies since then, um, not absolutely conclusive, but are inclined to a conclusion um, that what we're really seeing is a population of pulsars and are not seeing dark matter. To resolve this, we'll want to continue observations for longer and look for the corresponding dark matter signal in dwarf spheroidals. And if we do not see that, then the conclusion that this excess is uh, pulsars will be fairly solid. So moving outside our galaxy, we've lots and lots and lots, thousands of active galaxies that we're monitoring all the time with Fermi. And this has meant that we've had lots and lots and lots of multi-wavelength campaigns where we um, coordinate with observers from radio to optical to x-ray all the way up to the gamma ray to study how these objects behave as a function of time and a function of energy across the entire electromagnetic spectrum. And we can use this to explore um, what's happening in the jets of AGM. And if I had to draw a single uh, conclusion from everything that we've done is that none of our simple pictures of how these objects worked um, uh, fits um, all the data and that the real answer to understanding uh, what's going on in the jets of AGN is more complex than uh, one model fits all. But sometimes you can use um, uh, these light curves of AGN in a slightly different way. Um, one of the gamma ray bright objects, this uh, S3020218, is a gravitational lens. And we know from the um, radio observations um, what the expected uh, time delay is um, uh, from this lens. So I, I, don't, I should have had a picture of, of how this works, that you've got uh, a lensed blazar, there's a, a different um, uh, light path, so different travel time uh, for different um, paths around the um, lensing object, which means that you see a repeat of the same pattern. So what you're seeing here uh, is an observation where this object had been very quiet for most of the mission, uh, then suddenly went into a large flaring state where we had a dramatic increase, a sudden drop, and an increase again. And 11 and a half days later, we saw exactly the same pattern. Because we knew this was coming, you'll see that the, that the error bars are getting smaller. That's because we changed our observational mode to be ready to catch uh, the repeating flare when it happened. And if I overlay the two light curves, you can see that we really are seeing um, the same light curve being repeated twice. So how can you use this? Well, you can use this because Fermi is observing all the sky all the time. If we see a flare from this object, we can tell other people that a gamma ray flare is coming because there will be another one 11 and a half days later. So in July 2014 we saw another flare and we announced it and from that the TEV uh, observatory MAGIC um, went to take um, observations and they saw the delayed flare 11 days later. And the reason this is uh, such a spectacular result is this made it the most distant blazar that has ever been seen by a ground-based gamma ray observatory. And it knew, magic knew, when and where to look because Fermi was able to pass them the information. As the mission continues for more and more years, um, you get, we now open up the possibility to see things on timescales that were unattainable to us with just one, two, three, or even four years of data. So one of the things that we've been following is the light curve of, um, of this uh, object, um, PG1553. It appears to show a periodicity or episodic emission on a timescale of about 2.2 years. It's very hard to establish um, uh, periodic signals when you have so few uh, periods. So this is not um, yet statistically significant, but it's very suggestive. Um, and if we really are seeing 
um, some sort of quarter periodic, periodic emission. It might be telling us about magnetically driven um, accretion flow instabilities or jet precession, or perhaps we're seeing evidence of a binary black hole system. The results from Fermi have continued to be exciting. And they continue to be exciting because we have new partners that we can uh, collaborate with and use our data with. Um, and one example of this is the um, surge in interest in multi-messenger astrophysics. With gravitational waves, we're looking at uh, an extremely large release of energy in a small region of space, um, extremely large explosions. Um, these represent places where it's reasonable to expect um, uh, gamma ray emission. And indeed, that's the case. So in 2017, the GBM detected a perfectly normal gamma ray burst. Six minutes later, one of the LIGO uh, analysis pipelines found that they had um, a gravitational wave excess. 40 minutes later, they sent us an email saying, your perfectly normal gamma ray burst has an exciting friend. And, um, yeah, that sort of started a very exciting, um, uh, a very exciting um, few month period. If you look at the localization, um, the GBM is not particularly good at localizing uh, sources. So for this object, it had a localization of about 100 square degrees, but because the LIGO interferometer produces uh, bananas on the sky and um, the gamma ray burst monitor produces apples. When you um, intersect uh, an apple and a banana, you end up with a greatly reduced uh, error region. So you can see here that adding Fermi GBM localization to the two interferometer LIGO solution is in broad sense very similar to seeing uh, to adding uh, a third interferometer to the system in terms of, of localization. If we look at the gamma ray burst itself, it was a perfectly normal short gamma ray burst. It fell right in the middle of the distribution for observed energy release for a short burst. It wasn't strongly peaked, so the peak flux uh, is relatively low compared with relative to bursts with comparable uh, fluence. But what's remarkable here is that we know that this gamma ray burst we know from the gravitational wave information that this gamma ray burst is more than a factor of 10 closer than any previous short gamma ray bursts. So it shouldn't have appeared like a normal short gamma ray burst. It should have been blindingly bright. So intrinsically, this is an extremely unusual object, even though to, to uh, the observer, it appeared perfectly normal. Most short gamma ray bursts don't have a measured distance, so it does raise the interesting prospect that there is a population of short gamma ray bursts, uh, nearby short gamma ray bursts in our sample. And in fact, in a paper that came out a couple of months ago, we have one other burst that shows um, similar properties. Um, and to tell you those properties, what we see when we look at the spectrum of this um, uh, burst is that there's uh, two components. There's one sharp peak with non-thermal emission, and then there's a longer tail that lasts about four times as long that has a spectrum that's consistent with the thermal component. The only other burst, short burst in our data set that shows those properties is the second closest short gamma ray burst, where this is the closest. Um, so it is suggestive um, that these two components are in all short bursts and that this one is just close enough for us to be able to see it. But anyway, coming back to this, what we think is happening is that um, we're looking at this burst off to the edge of the jet. And as, as the jet is uh, coming out, it's um, uh, dragging material with it. So we have a relativistic jet and a cocoon, and we're seeing the non-thermal emission, the short spike from the relativistic jet, and then the longer tail from, the, from uh, a cocoon emission. And I'm gonna skip that because I'm moving on. A second area of uh, interest is looking at um, neutrinos and gamma rays. So what you're seeing in this, uh, in this movie is a map of all of the variable locations of the sky. So this is an analysis that, that picks out only those locations in the gamma ray sky that are, that are changing. So it's allowing us to pull out gamma ray flares. And as the time scale increases on the, um, as we go through this uh, ice cube, is starting to send out neutrino alerts, which are superimposed 
um, on this uh, chart. And one month after we found um, the first electromagnetic counterpart to a gravitational wave event with one instrument on Fermi, uh, with the other instrument we found um, a flaring blazar counterpart to a neutrino event. Um, this uh, object had started flaring um, several months before the neutrino arrived. So what you're seeing here is the light curve, the gamma rays as a function of time for this uh, object, um, where the x-axis is days from the arrival time of the neutrino. So you can see that for most of the mission, this was actually a fairly quiet, well-behaved um, uh, blazar that went into large outburst at just the time, uh, just before the um, neutrino was uh, found. The association of the gamma ray uh, outburst and the neutrino drove lots of follow-up observations, one of the most notable of which is the ground-based gamma ray instrument uh, MAGIC then um, found uh, 100 GeV gamma rays, showing that the spectrum is extending up to high energies. And then we had observations across the entire electromagnetic spectrum. So there's a couple of things that we can take from this. The association of the flaring AGN with the neutrino is the first plausible counterpart of an astrophysical source with a neutrino emitter. And that's telling us that that source is accelerating protons to extremely high energies. Those protons are interacting to produce uh, the neutrinos. The observations across the electromagnetic spectrum, including Fermi, now allow us to explore and fit uh, emission mechanisms uh, where we can uh, try and understand the particle balance in the uh, in the jet. So again, I'm, this is not the slide I was expecting, but uh, let me just, this is the one I wanted next. Um, so in the last uh, 10 years, we've done lots of things with Fermi, and I've told you about a few of them. Um, what's represented on this chart are all the topics for which we've issued a press release since the beginning of the mission. And they're arranged in distance from close to us to far away. And then there's the electrons over on the left-hand side because they're everywhere. Also on this chart, you'll see that some of the um, source classes are in white and some of them are in yellow. Um, and the reason that I've made a distinction between those two is the objects that are in yellow were not known prior to the launch of Fermi to be GeV gamma ray emitters. So what we've done with Fermi isn't just simply detecting more sources. It's not even studying more sources in detail. What we've done is dramatically expanded the reach of gamma ray astrophysics to a much, much broader fraction of the uh, uh, astronomical community. The people who used to be able to ignore gamma ray observations no longer can. Um, and the kind of information that we can provide um, is really critical because we in general can tell people what the maximum energy of emission was, what the energy budgets are. So now I'll get to my uh, final slide, which is to say that um, I I'm, just haven't put any sort of conclusion words, just to say that the first 10 years have been, of Fermi has been fantastic. Um, and I'm looking forward to what is yet to come, because as new instruments and observatories come online, what we're going to be able to do with Fermi will become better and better. Thank you. Any, we don't have any consumables, uh, so in principle we can keep operating until uh, something breaks um, in a catastrophic way. Um, both instruments on Fermi have a scientific performance now that is better than we were at launch, you know, in part because we've improved uh, configuration. Uh, we haven't had any um, failures um, that have affected science performance on either instrument. Um, the observatory itself is in fairly good shape. The orbit um, is good to at least uh, 2050. Um, we have had a failure of um, a solar array drive um, that has restricted our observations uh, somewhat, but we will be returning to normal um, survey operation uh, later next month. Um, so I'm 
cautiously confident that the money will run out before the observatory does. <laughs> Ah, no, the the um, time delay doesn't depend on photon uh, on photon energy. The time delay in the radio is the same as the time delay in the gamma ray. Um, the point I was making is that because we know we're going to see a delayed flare, um, we find um, the first example of the flare. Then we can tell um, our colleagues who have uh, pointed instruments that they need to look there at that time. Related to the geometry of the of the system, where the um, uh, lensing object is relative to the uh, b background blazar. So it would, be it would be different for different sources. It would be different for different sources. Yes. Yes. You were talking about that blazar of a year ago that had an accompanying neutrino mm -hmm. flash. Was the delay measured well enough to give a mass estimate for the neutrinos? Not, I mean, yes, in a um, in a sense that we have a we have a redshift and we have um, uh, a well-defined flare. The problem is that the um, flaring activity in the gamma ray um, is on timescales of months. Um, so we don't, in the case of the of the gamma ray burst and the uh, gravitational wave event, then um, we have a much sharper, more discrete event, so we can get a good measure of um, time delay between, maximum allowed time delay between the gravitational waves and the photons. In this particular case, um, we can't know where in that few month period the neutrino came to better than a few months. Ah, no, the six minutes is how long it took um, uh, LIGO to find uh, that they had an excess in their data. The actual time delay between um, the gravitational waves and the gamma rays was 1.7 um, seconds. Um, so we've been able to measure um, the uh, sort of constrain the difference in speed between photons and gravitational waves um, extremely precisely and to also, um, with that same uh, measurement, uh, infer that both are seeing the gravitational potential of the Milky Way in the same way. Um, so that I re realized as I got on to talking about neutrinos that I forgot to make that point. That's uh, the time delay between the gamma rays and the gravitational waves is, is one of the sort of largest scientific takeaways of that, of that measurement. Um, well, since both um, both instruments um, are essentially seeing all the sky or all the sky that's available to them at any instrument, you don't actually really need any real time uh, real time communication. Um, however, we are also have we also have subthreshold searches where um, uh, we're sharing subthreshold uh, triggers to LIGO, and they're sharing subthreshold triggers to us, where you could combine the information from both instruments to get above uh, thresholds. So there is some communication there, but um, you know, in terms of finding an association, because we're seeing the whole sky all the time, uh, we could do this um, whenever. Uh, in practice, of course, we want to do it as quickly as possible because we've got a role to play in helping other people um, uh, do their follow-up observations. I'm sorry, I'm not following on this time difference. Uh, the gamma ray is going at C. So are you saying the gravitational wave is not no, uh, what I'm saying is the gravitational waves are going at sea um, to a precision um, that's uh, much better than it ever was ever previously so measured. What's the time difference caused by that you mentioned? So um, there's lots of possible um, causes for this. I, so I didn't show the movie, but now I will because you've asked um, if it'll play. Um, 
so the, as the system is, um, is approaching uh, coalescence, the um, gravitational wave signal is increasing as the two neutron stars are spiraling closer and closer together. Um, but the gamma rays are produced in a jet that forms um, afterwards. Um, so it takes um, some time for that jet to be formed. It also takes some time for the uh, conditions in the jet to drop so that you have sufficiently low, low opacity to allow the, um, the gamma rays to uh, escape. Um, so you really do expect um, the gamma rays to come not a long time after, but you know, come after the, um, after the merger itself. Um, well, I think we've learned, um, you mean, the thing we would have liked to have seen but we haven't seen is probably uh, evidence of uh, dark matter from uh, WIMP annihilation. Um, and there those results are interesting because we've been able to set um, uh, our uh, limits on the cross-section down below uh, the thermal uh, cross-section. So if you have an amount of, of dark matter that is consistent with um, um, thermal processes in the, uh, in the early, I'm not explaining this very well, <laughs> I don't have a concise way of saying it, but um, we have good reasons to know um, what cross-section is interesting for WIMP annihilating dark matter. And since we can measure the mass of dark matter in uh, regions of the sky, um, our non-detection of dark matter in dwarf spheroidals um, allows us to set um, upper limits on the cross section um, and therefore exclude um, a ter WIMP dark matter at those energies at the thermal cross section. Um, other things that we haven't seen that we expected to see include things like uh, galaxy clusters. Um, we had assumed we would probably see uh, gamma ray emission from galaxy clusters because they contain um, uh, you know, very energetic particles, and we didn't. I'm not sure that I would say we expected to see gamma rays from binary black hole mergers. Um, I think the jury is still out on, um, on I, I mean, I didn't mention this, but we, had a, we have a, um, a three sigma um, association of a gamma ray transient with a merging black hole system. Um, but to really take confidence in that wheel, we'll have to wait to see another one. Uh, no, it, it um, the uh, the flare continued. Um, it does. It does. So it, it died off quickly after that. Or? No, it didn't die off quickly after that. It stayed. It stayed up and then dropped afterwards. Pierre, yeah. you mentioned that maybe two million years ago, an event occurred at the center of the galaxy that produced the bubbles, the Fermi bubbles, which could either be an annihilation of WIMPs, which may not exist, or pulsars, but what event could be? Uh, okay, so there, were, there are actually two separate things going on here. Um, the activity at the galactic center is not related to, um, am I going the right direction? Um, so these bubbles are, um, sort of 50 degrees above and 50 degrees below. So they're very, very large um, uh, systems uh, that are possibly produced by um, jet activity at the galactic center when maybe like a, a star was, uh, was sucked in. Separately to that, much, much closer in is where we see the second uh, excess. So we're seeing, we have two separate phenomena that we're seeing. Um, the Fermi bubbles, which are telling us about activity at the galactic center itself, um, and then um, the excess, which is telling us about either a population of sources uh, or um, dark matter annihilation. Um, so we have, I mean, we have two interesting uh, mysteries that are centered at the galactic center, but they're distinct. Are any of your observations related to these sort of things? Or like a 
Uh, no, I mean I, I've I haven't read any of the papers on that, but I did see the see the uh, the press releases. To my knowledge, we're not doing anything explicit um, about those uh, about those uh, about those uh, events. I agree, they're in, intriguing. I'm going to ask the last question. So when one of Fermi's best friends comes back on the air, mm -hmm. LIGO, take a educated guess at how many more coalescences, the rate of coalescences <laughs> with short duration coincidences with short duration gamma ray bursts will be seen. Um, my educated guess would be sort of one to three per year. One to a few per year. With the sensitivity that you have for O3. And Bob agrees, right? <laughs> Yes. Okay. Well, I think let's thank you.